good evening. If I could ask you to sit down so that we can get started. This is a special meeting of the Princeton Planning Board. It's Thursday, September 6, 2018. And the opening statement is as follows. Pursuant to Section 13 of the Open Public Meetings Act, adequate notice of the time and place of this meeting has been given by prominently posting the sunshine notice of the Princeton Planning Board. Such notice has been placed on the official bulletin board at the Princeton Municipal Complex and by transmitting a copy of the notice to the Princeton Packet, Town Topics, The Times, Comcast Systems, and by filing a copy with the Clerk of Princeton on the 27th day of August, 2018. Would you call the roll, please? Yes. Here. Here. Mr. Stankowitz. Here. Mr. Texarney. Here. Mrs. Ullman. Here. Mr. Williamson. Ms. Wilson. Here. Mrs. Gunning. Here. Ms. Sachs. Mr. Oakman. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Are there any announcements? Anyone? Something that the board needs to know or hear? All right. Um, you should have received in your packet the findings of fact and resolution. The first thing is landmark at Princeton LLC. This is from J July 12th of this year. It's a request for an extension. Anyone have any comments, emendations, questions? No? Does someone want to move that? I'll, I'll move approval? it. A second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Now, you had four sets of minutes. The first set is the regular meeting of November 2nd, 2017. Any corrections, additions, anyone? Um, I had one on page it's the Eisenhardt Arch, not the Eisenhower Arch. It's a little more local than national. Anything else? Anyone? Uh, on page two in the third paragraph, um, it says that uh, early next year the officers would discuss items concerning work in 2018. Is that 18 or 19? Should it be? Page two. I guess, um, I guess it was 18 because this was back in 2017. Okay. 17, so it so, probably was. Yeah, yeah, this is. Right. Okay, this is from 17, so it is, I guess, 18. Um, anything else? If not, does someone want to move approval? I move approval is corrected. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded for approval as corrected. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, the next set is the regular meeting of December 14th, 2017. Any additions, corrections? Anyone? Um, page three. Page, sorry? The, page three, the third paragraph from the bottom. I think it's just a um, word choice. Uh, Mr. Goldman advised that the applicant was filed. I think that should be the application was filed. <laughs> I think so. Good catch. Anything else? Anyone? All right. Hearing none, could would someone like to move approval as corrected? I move, move approval as corrected. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. All right, the next set of minutes is from February 15th of this year. Again, are there any corrections, additions? Um, I had one on this on page two, the f first paragraph, instead of replacing the existing nothing, it should be replace the existing sign noting. 
right at the top of the page. So adding the word sign. Yep. Sign and it's And then changing it to noting. noting. This sign was never approved. Anything else? Hmm? Well, the word sign is after the after Michelin. So the word sign is still in there, but nothing should be noting. Okay. Well. Right. <laughs> replace the existing. Doesn't make sense. The existing 35 square foot Michelin sign. It's just that the parenthetical phrase in between makes it difficult to understand. Of course, you're right. Well, what do you want to do? Just change it and go on or yes. send it back? I think back? you could say replacing the existing 35 square foot Michelin sign, noting that this sign was never approved with the Mavis logo, the front, you see what I'm saying? That cleans it up. Yeah. Alan is suggesting that we put the parentheses at the end of the sentence. That's right. Oh, all the way at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Sure. Does it work for all of you? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. With those corrections, anyone? I'll move it. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Right. The last set of minutes is the special meeting of July 26, 2018. And um, any additions, corrections? I, I just gave a, a, a couple of uh, minor edits uh, to Eileen, but it's that um, I should be noted as, uh, as being there. I th that's the only change, actually. Oh. I'm sorry. That's the only change. You were there, right? Yes. Okay. And um, on the first page of this, there's a, a, a repetition of acknowledging. <clears throat> yeah, no, could have. And um, anything <laughs> else, anybody? Um, I don't know if you list alternates who were absent, but I was absent that day. Well, might as well. Mr. Oakman, let me put that down too. Let's see. And Greg was here, right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Anything else, anyone? With these corrections, would somebody like to move for approval? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carry. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, that brings us up to the first hearing for this evening. It's Main Street Eats LLC. It's a minor site plan with variances. 277 Witherspoon Street, Block. 7101 lot 15 and um, let's see I guess that that the, um, okay I guess that we'll start with Dan Dobomilski on this Dan if you'd like to kind of walk us through this Yes, I will. Good evening. Um, Dan Dubermilski, uh, planner for this application. Yep. Mike here. Just, do you swear or affirm to tell truth, to testify truthfully in this application? I do. Thank you. Dan Dubermilski, uh, planner uh, for this application for the municipality. Um, I'd submitted a report on July 16th. Um, and there's also a report from the uh, municipal or the land use engineer and zoning officer of July 17th uh, for this application. This is for a minor site plan 
uh, specifically parking variants. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. And there's also a report from the traffic engineer uh, dated September 5, 2018. Um, the first paragraph of the report uh, from the land use engineer and zoning officer provides a history of this and what's existing. So I won't go over that unless someone needs any more detail on that. Um, basically, the property is on Witherspoon Street at, at Henry. Um, the applicant is seeking uh, approval in the form of a parking variance to facilitate an increase in the number of seats at the existing and operating restaurant to go from 92 seats to 181 seats. Uh, the, municip the municipal code requires parking at a rate of one parking stall for every four seats. Uh, thus, by doing that, they would need 46 parking stalls. Uh, they are short 23 parking stalls uh, in their allocation in the adjacent parking garage. So it's a shortage of 23 parking stalls. Um, basically, when the board reviews this or analyzes it, you have to weigh the detriments versus the benefits. And I've listed a number of points that I thought the applicant might want to provide some testimony to the board uh, regarding the benefits and detriments or potential detriments uh, of this proposal. Um, and I don't know if you want me to go through those, but I, I could either go through those or we could have testimony from the applicant to do that. Speaks. Could you do it so you want me to go through them? Yes, just briefly. Okay. So uh, the first one is just basically indicating that a restaurant is a desirable establishment in a mixed-use neighborhood because it supports the typical needs of a residence while encouraging walking and facilitating social interaction. The restaurant is a permitted use in the zone and was previously subject of site plan review and approval. The second point was that the peak hours of the restaurant, typically evenings and weekends, will occur outside the typical peak hours of office uses, the other uses in these buildings. Uh, the third was that the on-street parking present on several streets in the neighborhood, and there was a question, do the patrons of the restaurant use, use the allocated garage space as the primary parking choice, or do they tend to park on the street first, and if so, uh, does this create any issues or does the restaurant encourage the use of the parking garage to try and uh, not overload the parking on the streets if that's if they could even overload it the final or the next point was that the applicants parking study offered the observation that at least 48 parking spaces were actually available within the parking garage to accommodate the additional 23 spaces required <coughs> for the proposed expanded seating However, I noted that the study was conducted in February, and I wasn't sure if the restaurant was actually fully operational at that time. Um, so th some testimony about whether they were or not would be helpful. And uh, uh, asked if there were any additional observations that could be offered relative to the availability of parking within the garage or upon the impact of parking on the street during the spring and summer months when outdoor seating and pedestrian movements are more likely to occur and finally the question was uh, are there any safeguards that the applicant could indicate uh, if for some reason there, there was an abundance of use at this site and the parking was not sufficient in the garage are there any safeguards or any other uh, things that they could offer that might make the board, board me feel more comfortable that granting this variance will not create a detriment um, I did have one thing that I didn't have in the report, which they may want to just testify to as well, which is just um, if they could indicate that they uh, sometimes when you add seating to a restaurant, a plumbing code, which is not a subject of this board, could come into it as to whether they have sufficient restroom facilities. Um, and I just kind of alert them that they should make sure that they're aware of that, that they have to have sufficient restroom facilities as well when you're adding seats to a, park, uh, to a restaurant typically. Um, but it's not something that typically would be subject to this board. That would be subject to building code review. Thank you. Any questions for Dan? Anyone? <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see. We also have 
Brian Stankus report, which I think was at your seats when you came in. If you uh, yeah, yeah, there was a revised uh, report, but basically the full report was previously distributed. There's just one minor correction in the report. So what you, the board has had the report. Right. Uh, but I, Brian, did you want to say something about this, and can we swear you in? <coughs> yes, Mr. Stank, do you swear, swear or affirm to testify truthfully in this application? I do. Thank you, Wayne. Just very briefly, I, I think our, our report focused on a, a review and a verification of the, of the Sam Schwartz uh, parking report, which again evaluated existing, uh, the existing number of available parking spaces, the number of parking spaces that would have to address existing floor space in the two buildings that is vacant, and then coming up with a, a, a theoretical surplus, uh, which we agreed uh, appears to be more than sufficient to address the 23 spaces uh, or the, the additional parking demand of the 23 seats. And uh, just building on Dan's comment, I, we, we conducted an observation of the, the number of parking spaces in the garage in July and found an almost identical uh, number of park, uh, parked vehicles as the, the parking study that was done in February by the applicant's consultant. We had a couple of additional you know, minor requests for clarification and testimony, but I think we'll, we'll hear what the applicant has to say for those. Okay, thank you. Is there, are there questions for Brian? Anyone? No? Did you have something? Okay. All right. Um, we also have a report from Jack West and Derek Bridger, and maybe we could get you sworn in, so. Uh, Jack and Derek, do you swear or affirm to testify truthfully in this application? I do. I do. Thank you. Okay. And did you have something that you wanted to say about this? I just report? wanted to add a, a point of uh, information. Um, the municipality is actually looking into putting meters on Witherspoon in front of that area and also on Henry. So that's something that's coming out of the, uh, the parking study. So there eventually most likely will be meters both on Witherspoon and on Henry. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, Jack, how, how do you expect that to affect the, the numbers in this study? I don't think it'll have any impact. It's just right now people are parking for free Will there. they be one hour or two hour or what? I think it's going to be actually three hour meters and actually changing some of the meters on, uh, on Franklin to either three or five hours. Right <coughs> now I think they're 12 or 14 hours on Franklin. They would be reduced the time frame on those. So, sorry, that's, that's adding um, meters to the existing parking on Henry, but you're not creating any new parking, right? Not creating any new parking, no. Derek, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think everything's been covered. Okay. Uh, just in terms of the application, I think 28 of the new spaces are outdoors. Is that correct? Well, I think they're all in the garage. Outdoor seating? Oh, the 20, uh, there's outdoor seating, yes, sir. Yeah. For the restaurant. So, meant, right. the park so that's yeah. seasonal as well as uh, whatever gotcha. else. Some of those added spaces. That's correct. Seven of the 23 or six. I'm, I'm, I just want to add uh, a comment to Jack's comment, which is that decision hasn't been made by council exactly what kind of parking is going to be going in there. And I do know that there has been discussion with the parking consultant about solutions for longer term parking for downtown employees, possibly being on the street in these areas. Uh, so whether it's gonna be a three, three hour meters or it's gonna be more 10 hour meters or it's gonna be on street permit parking for employees who qualify for that program. I think all of that stuff is still up in the air. But I do think the point is important that there's a lot of interest in that on-street parking for one purpose or another and to uh, get the applicant to address whether they're relying on that parking to solve part of their parking need is an important part of their testimony. Okay, yes, Maria? Uh, yeah. It's been my observation that people do use the on-street parking first and, and then the garage. 
Um, and even when the restaurant is full, I can rarely yeah, see in the garage. We can't hear you down at this end. Oh, Speak right sorry. I, it's been my observation that uh, people do use the on-street parking first, and then when that's full, they go to the garage. So it would be useful for the restaurant to encourage patrons to use the garage. I have noticed that some people don't even un realize that the garage is affiliated with the restaurant. They think that it's parking for the Avalon Bay residents. I'm wondering if the restaurant or the restaurants there had considered a relationship with the garage where they have this, the sticker, um, where, where when you have a meal, they give you a stamp and that gives you a discount on the garage. Had, do you know if they're... Okay, thank you. At, at a minimum, it would be useful to, you know, um, let uh, diners know that the garage is available. I get that. Yes. Mrs. Allman? Um, I just want to make sure that the applicant and then going through the, the application um, does answer the questions that Dan raised and, and then um, uh, some, of the, some, of the, some of the concerns, I think all of the concerns I had going into this were raised um, either by Brian or by Dan, but I particularly wondered um, number 20 in the report from um, I forgot what the <coughs> I I H engineers is that the name of it now? Well, number twenty, which, which talked about the traffic impacts, um, not, as opposed to the parking impacts. I mean, you do stress that the additional eighty-nine seats could create two hundred and fifty to two hundred and seventy-five trips per weekdays. Well. I mean, that, I thought that sounded like a lot. I mean, and I didn't think that you thought it sounded like a lot. But anyhow, I'd like to find out, one, what the traffic, what the, what the applicant's estimate of this additional traffic on the street would be, and also um, how much parking is going on in the, the neighbor, on the neighboring streets, which I think is a, an issue that, should concern us. Okay, any, anything else, or shall we hear from the applicant now, please? Good evening, Chairwoman, members of the board, Allison Cassetta from the firm of Price, Meese, Shulman, and Darminio, appearing on behalf of the applicant, Main Street Eats, LLC. Uh, I'd like to say that your professionals made my job very easy because they covered everything I was going to say in my introduction and yep. more. Um, I, I, what, what they didn't cover is I'm going to swear you in. And I'm, just, I'm the attorney. I know, but to the extent you lapse into testimony, do you swear or affirm to testify truthfully? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I think that our presentation will be fairly brief. We've heard everyone's comments and are prepared to address them. I just would like to confirm that our notice of tonight's hearing was adequate before I proceed. Yes, Ms. Thank Catronio you. has confirmed that. Thank, Thank you. you. With that said, um, our first witness will be James Naughn, who is a principal of the applicant. Sir, would you state your name and spell it for the record? James Naughn. Uh, it's spelled N-A-W-N. And do you swear or affirm to testify truthfully in this application? I do. Thank you. Mr. Naughn, would you first tell the board what your position is with Main Street Eats, LLC? I'm the um, owner of the restaurant. So you have an intimate knowledge of the operations there, correct? Yes. Uh, would you just give them a, an overview of the restaurant, when it opened, what your hours of operation are in general? We opened uh, December 20th of last year. Um, we opened uh, completely, meaning that we started serving lunch and dinner as we've continued to do so. So we open at 11.30 in the morning, um, just about every day. And then depending on the, uh, the day of the week, we will close at 9, 10, 11, maybe 12, uh, on, based on the season and the, and the day of the week. 
And by this application, you're proposing to increase the number of seats in the restaurant, correct? Correct. And could you explain to the board the reasons why you're proposing to do that? The, the restaurant space that we've leased is 10,000 square feet, and um, it's a large space. And the current um, number of seats, 92, um, is not adequate to sort of take advantage of um, how we would like to present and operate the restaurant. We also have a lower level, um, which will be used for um, private events um, and things uh, like that, uh, which will require seating too. Um, it will be only on the busy nights that um, we would have a chance to occupy all the seats. Um, so the um, the, seat, the number of seats that we're proposing are spread through the space um, in the different areas and different uses um, and will be used accordingly. And can you confirm for the board that you're not proposing to expand the actual space or make any changes to the exterior of the building? That's correct. We're just adding uh, tables and chairs. And there was a question from the board professionals regarding the hours of operation and whether they will change as a result of the seating increase. Can you answer that? I would say it's unlikely. Um, we've had several months now of watching the business patterns and knowing Princeton well through my other restaurants. Um, Princeton is not a, a town that goes late into the night um, unless there's a very unusual <laughs> situation. So I would, um, I would guess it's going to probably follow the same pattern, and that is that the prime dining hours are the hours where we're going to be in the greatest demand for the seats. Um, and the um, operating hours as we have them now will not change materially. Thank you. Uh, and you heard the questions regarding where patrons tend to park and whether you guide them toward the garage or they tend to find street parking first. Uh, can you tell them a little bit about what typically happens? Well, I think it, it was said that um, patrons generally park on the street um, first and then find the garage. And it's been my experience in 20 years of living in Princeton, that's generally the way the town behaves, uh, regardless of the neighborhood. And this is no different. Um, the um, question that was raised about uh, validation of parking, if I can be blunt, the restaurant business is not a high margin operation and validating parking is a fairly material expense um, in a town where paying for parking is a custom. Uh, and I'm not aware of other restaurants that are well, I'm, I'm sure somebody could be, but in general, there's not any validation of parking. And, I, and I'm sure that my other fellow restaurant operators would agree that's the reason. It's just a, economically a very challenging uh, amenity to provide. So we find that our patrons do choose to park in the most obvious and convenient spot. Um, but I do know from experience that the garage is used when those spots are not available. Would you be willing as a condition if this board were to approve the application to just hang up some signage inside the restaurant letting customers know that the garage parking is there for their use? Sure, that, that's, that's not a problem. Thank you. Uh, and finally, there were some questions about deliveries. If you could tell the board a little bit about the frequency, the size and types of trucks, where they unload when they make the deliveries. Well, there's a variety of types of deliveries from UPS, UPS and FedEx uh, to um, Samuel and Sun Seafood to um, uh, 18 wheelers that, that uh, generally drop the generic sorts of ingredients and paper goods. The deliveries are received in between our building, which is 277 Witherspoon Street, and the other building, the, um, the darker brick building, which is 281 Witherspoon. So, um, in the loading area between the parking garage and those two buildings, and then in the area between the two buildings is where the delivery activity occurs um, from those various types of, of trucks. There's also um, waste management that, that uh, hauls uh, the trash as well. Um, I think the, the configuration of the site protects um, surrounding you know, residential uh, from really bearing the brunt of noise and activity. And, you know, the, the, um, the hours of those deliveries generally happen after 8 a.m. and well before 5 p.m. And do you expect that those operations will need to change as a result of the proposed seating increase? 
No, the, 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 I know it seems intimidating because the number of seats is doubling, but um, as I explained before, the yield on the use of those seats is not 100%, so it's not going from 90 seats every day to 180 seats. Um, and so the deliveries uh, generally, and as I hope, business increases will expand, but not to the point where there are going to be uh, changes to the deliveries. And I said that was my last question, but I have one more. Mm -hmm. uh, the board planner had asked uh, that we make sure the, that you have sufficient plumbing facilities. Um, I know that the architectural plan does reflect some restroom plumbing fixture calculations. Um, in having this plan prepared, did you and the architect consider the plumbing needs and make sure that that would be addressed when, when application, I'm sorry, when application is made for permits? Yeah, and there was, there's another thing too, the, the ingress and egress in the basement uh, was built in such a way for life safety issues to be covered um, so that the basement could be utilized. The, um, the restrooms have been built uh, to accommodate an occupancy of 200. Um, my experience with Agricola, um, you know, forewarned me that that was something in our anticipation of this application. So the plumbing fixtures will cover the additional seating according to code. Thank you. Those are all the questions that I have. Okay, thank you. And did you have other witnesses? I'm sorry? Do you have other witnesses? Yes, I have two more. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions at this point? No? Oh, Mr. Quinn. Yes. Uh, Mr. Nunn, where do you where do your employees park? Um, well, the, the um, the good fortune of this location it means that um, the most number of employees who work in this restaurant live in this neighborhood, um, which is which is great. Um, we have parking spaces. I may be off. It's 14 to 16 parking spaces uh, with permits in the garage. So the um, as far as I'm aware, anybody who's driving to work, the managers for sure and anybody else who's in the building who's driving um, is in the garage with the use of the um, permits that have been provided by the landlord. Thank you. And I, I must confess that I forgot to bring my reports tonight. So could you tell me what your overall staffing is for the restaurant and what you expect the total staffing to be when I, I assume these would be catered events, special events that are going to be in the expanded area. Mm -hmm. So if we could get a side, uh, a, an idea of what your typical, say, evening, your your dinner staffing is and, and what a sort of catering staff would right. be. We would operate the restaurant, uh, depending on, on the time of day, um, with as few as six employees and as many as 14 employees. Um, and when we have a catered event, um, generally we get um, food production out of the staff that's there. Um, we may add a, a, a couple of servers. That would be the impact of something where we had a, an a la carte business going on the ground level and a, um, you know, a, a private event in the basement. Thank you. Sure. Yes, Ms. Ullman? Um, I, I, this question is totally off the relevant charts, but do you have any idea whether, uh, to the degree to which the residents of Avalon Bay are using the restaurants, are there people who come regularly? What we have found at Two Sevens is more uh, families coming to dine, um, and uh, a, a great number of them are walking from the neighborhoods that surround the Avalon Bay um, uh, complex is, you know, closest to us, and we have a lot of patrons, um, families or, or just singles or, or couples that come over. I can't tell you exactly how many, but I only know that um, in some cases uh, they feel very comfortable being in there, you know, just casually or, or dining or whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, we, we're, we're happy to be located next to Avalon and, in, and, and also in the neighborhoods because, like I said, it's nice to... Um, it's nice to see the families walking to the restaurant. There's something nice about that. The reason, the reason I ask is that I guess maybe it was only Wanda and Alan and I who sat through all of the Avalon Bay hearings painfully some mm -hmm. time ago. And 
had asked and, and hoped that they would put in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And they, and, and as I recall, the residents of the neighborhood said it would never work, that there wasn't sort of, it wasn't going to happen. So I'm really happy it did happen. I think it was a very good thing. But well, well, I'm glad you. to see the predictions being <clears throat> wrong. Yeah. Well, we we can't depend just on Avalon Bay, but I think the combination of, of the activity and people learning that we're there as well. Um, some people don't like to park downtown, and it's nice to be on the outskirts. So yeah. um, slowly but surely, it's building. And as a neighborhood res resident that walks there, um, and, and whether that's my destination or not, passing by, I see people park and go in, I see people walk over from Avalon, and I see, of course, people from the Witherspoon Jackson neighborhood, but I think also from Merwick Stanworth neighborhood as well. So it really is a, a walking destination restaurant. That's right. Mm, nice. Yeah. And biking, I guess, too, with bicycles. Mm -hmm. You said you had some more witnesses. I do. Our next witness will be our traffic expert, Louis Lugio. What's his name? Thank you. Would you state your name for the record and spell it, please? Sure. It's Louis, L O U I S, Lugio. It's L U G L I O. And do you swear or affirm to testify truthfully tonight? Yes, I do. Thank you. And will you first give the board the benefit of your educational background and qualifications? Sure. Uh, I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey, New York, and a few other states. I have a BS in civil engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology, a master's in transportation planning, also from NJIT. I have been um, both an expert witness for applications, but also for municipalities throughout the state of New Jersey over the past 30 years, uh, as well as an expert for NJDOT on a number of occasions. And your license is current and in good standing? Yes, it is. Thank you. We accept his credentials. Thank you. Now, you prepared the shared parking analysis that was submitted as part of the application, correct? Yes, I did. If you could maybe take the board through that and just explain uh, the counts that you took and the methodology that you used. Sure. Uh, again, for the board, this is a combination mixed-use buildings of office, retail, and restaurant. Um, what we tried to do is to get a real depiction of what was happening as far as parking is concerned. Uh, so, may, I, may I interrupt for a sure. moment? The report you're referring to, is that the one under, under the name of Sam Schwartz? Or is there yes, th okay. this is the May 10th, 2018 Sam Schwartz ta Transportation Consultants. And are you associated with that firm or how is? I am a vice president of Sam Schwartz. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. He actually signed that first page. Good. So uh, what we tried to do was to get a, a handle, a, a realistic handle on the number of parking spaces uh, that were utilized uh, for the 277, 281 Witherspoon uh, facilities. There's 186 parking spaces that are dedicated to uh, 277, 281, and the balance of the parking spaces in the garage are dedicated to the residents uh, th that are there. And so from that 186 parking spaces, what we tried to do uh, and what we have done in the past for restaurant type uses is to look at a typical weekday, which is a Tuesday. We also look at a Friday and we look at a Saturday. Uh, we did counts, uh, these counts were done in February, February 2nd, 3rd, and the 6th. And they were conducted from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And that's really to capture that lunchtime activity. And then also from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. to capture and identify what the peak parking demand is uh, for the p.m. And, and normally uh, the 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. captures 
the peak time or the peak parking time for people coming to the restaurant. Uh, what we found during those counts of those three days is that the maximum number of parking spaces that were utilized for, uh, for not only the restaurant but for 277 and 281 Witherspoon uh, buildings combined. There were maximum number of 70 parking spaces that were utilized. And uh, based on that, there were 48 parking spaces that remained available. Uh, what we also tried to do was to look at unoccupied space uh, in the combination of buildings. And I took the conservative approach of looking at uh, office of about 7,600 uh, square feet, retail of about 1,500 square feet, and an additional office of about 4,000 square feet. Uh, and those parking requirements for those uses that were unoccupied uh, at the time uh, were 39 for the retail, 9 for the, um, sorry, 39 for the office, 9 for the retail, and 20 for the other office. Altogether, that unoccupied space that I wanted to account for totaled 68 parking spaces. Uh, and so, if I take the 106, I'm sorry, 186 spaces that are available, minus the 70 that were occupied, that leaves us 116 spaces, minus the 68 spaces that we would dedicate for these uh, unoccupied uses, and that's where the 48 available parking spaces come from. Uh, as others have pointed out, the additional 92 seats would require 23 parking spaces, certainly more than enough uh, given that 48 parking spaces would be available. And so based on, on those conclusions and in addition to uh, some of the, the points that were mentioned in that uh, the shared use of these spaces really fits well with the office component of these two buildings versus the restaurant component. And certainly, you know, 5 to 6 p.m., the office um, demand is, is certainly almost gone, and the restaurant is really starting to pick up in its intensity. So there's a very good symbiotic relationship between these two different land uses. Um, and so we also identified, as was mentioned, that there is on-street parking uh, in the area. We, we did not do a utilization count of the on-street parking. We did notice that, for the most part, that on-street parking uh, was utilized. It was not 100% utilized, but it was utilized. Uh, and so that was the basis of this parking utilization study and, and shared parking analysis that, that the report that, that we did. One question about the street parking. Um, there was a question about whether the restaurant relies on the street parking. In doing all of these calculations and determining that the number of spaces in the garage can accommodate the increase, you weren't adding anything in, correct, for street parking. Like, we're, we're, not, we're not taking those out of the equation. So with or without those, is that correct? That, the that's garage correct. can accommodate the increase. That's right. Regardless, even, you know, not even talking about the on-street parking at all, uh, there, there are enough parking spaces within the garage structure to support this and still have parking spaces remaining. Uh, obviously, the, the parking on street is utilized to some degree, and that would just be additional parking, depending on what uh, the municipality does with metered parking and paying for those spaces, I don't think has any bearing on this application or the operation of the garage and restaurant. Uh, and finally, the board's traffic expert asked about actual traffic impacts. In his report, there are some estimated trip generation numbers uh, in the opinion that they will not have any measurable impact on traffic around the property. Would you generally agree with those calculations and that conclusion? Uh, I do, and so, <clears throat> The, uh, on item number 21 uh, from his report, the Institute of Transportation Engineer, Engineers Trip Generation, the ITE Trip Generation publication, 
uh, is what we utilize to look at the number of estimated vehicle trips for different types of land uses. And so it gives us a good uh, average. Obviously, it could be a little higher, it could be a little less. But these, uh, these formulas are based on, in many cases, hundreds or thousands of studies across the nation to come up with a, a pretty good estimate of what the number of new trips would be. And so that 250 to 275 trips per weekday it is certainly is that. It's over the course of the entire day. So for the restaurant operation, it may actually be, uh, as the applicant pointed out, the, the opening of the restaurant is at 1130 in the morning, uh, but certainly employees are coming in earlier. So I would say anywhere from 10 or 1030 in the morning until 1030 or 11 o'clock at night, whenever time they close, that is the time period where the 250 to 275 uh, trips would be coming from. Uh, and, and certainly plus or minus 25 trips during the week, uh, weekday peak hour, uh, evening peak hour, and 30 trips uh, during the Saturday peak time is certainly what is, what is suggested, what is reasonable. And these numbers are based on everyone coming by automobile. And so it, it could certainly be a conservative approach looking at uh, 30 peak hour trips or one every other uh, minute, one every two minutes. Uh, we most likely would have even less because as you heard, there are many people that, that walk to the restaurant. And so if we err on the side of being conservative, there would be 30 additional trips in the PM peak hour uh, and that is not a significant amount of traffic for the roadway network, uh, certainly here. And so that would, in my opinion, I would uh, call that negligible um, as far as traffic impacts are concerned. No further questions for me. Okay. Are there questions for Mr. Luther? Go ahead. I have a couple. Um, my first question relates to the way you did the calculations of uh, sort of what the surplus spaces are, and it was based on the, the requirements of the vacant space in the office buildings, you know, and then basically what was currently being used in the garage. But I am curious what the requirements are, the ordinance requirements are for the spaces that are not vacant in the rest of the office building, because some of those offices and so forth might might, might be underutilized now, not fully occupied, and they may need more parking spaces as well as the restaurant, and I'm wondering if you looked at, at that at all. Uh, we, we did not look at or go through the analysis of all of the occupied spaces and what the parking requirement uh, was for, for all of that. Uh, the only thing that we did take is the 186 spaces that were dedicated for 277, 281. And we worked from that point uh, forward based on the reality of what was being used by the land uses that are, that are currently there um, and the additional unoccupied space. So we- But, we, but that we, sort of suggests that those other occupied spaces would actually, could potentially be filling up a lot more of those 186 spaces than they are currently. If, that's true. If they, based patterns. on the code, that's true. Right. Okay. That's one question. The other question is regarding your sort of uh, contention that this is symbiotic parking demand with the office space. And mm -hmm. I, I just would like to get, maybe it's not so much for you, but for the owner testimony that, in fact, the evening hours are consistently the busiest time at lunch hour is a lighter, uh, lighter clientele. We, we can bring him back once the board is done with their questions of this witness. Okay. Yes, Alan? I think can you help us understand what you're applying for? Because part of your argument is you don't need a variance. You have enough space within the 186. No, we have requested the variance. I understand. The, ar the argument is, realistically speaking, the conditions that are there now, the existing spaces can accommodate it. 
but under the ordinance, we definitely do need a variance. So that's would say that the requirement is 186 spaces plus 23, and that's what the variance is applied for? Correct. So it's a shortage of 23 spaces. Okay. And was the 186 based on a calculation of a 92-seat restaurant? That's the number of spaces that are currently dedicated. I um, and I believe that was calculated based on the site plan from when this building was constructed. That had a zoning table on it that broke down the uses and the parking requirement for each. Some are by square footage or... So in that calculation, which I guess I haven't seen, but there was that was based on a 92-seat yes. restaurant? Yes. Um, and if you give me a second, I think I have a copy of that plan Great. with me. Yeah, cer certainly the 186 was based on that approved site plan that included all of the land uses that were proposed for 277, 281. Um, and as Allison is looking for that, I'm not sure if, if all of the land uses that were part of that application mm -hmm. are in actuality in the buildings today including the unoccupied spaces that I accounted for. But the 186 is for both buildings combined. Right. Mr. Porter, I found the plan. We actually submitted a copy of this for reference. Um, and it said proposed conditions. And then within the breakdown for 277, it had proposed restaurant use, 92 seats okay. at one per, per four you. seats. Just one last question. You said, so 70 is the utilization now? That's right. But it would be greater if on-street parking were not used. Uh, it, it might, it certainly might be more in terms of the occupied spaces in the garage mm -hmm. if for some reason those on-street spaces were not available or at some rate that was not consistent with the garage rate, which is a dollar per hour. Uh, so certainly there would be m more people that would park there. Uh, the question is how many, and, and we didn't, there's no way at this point right. to understand that. But to the extent the testimony was, was that the on-street parking doesn't enter into the calculation, I guess it does to the extent that the 70 would be greater if there weren't on-street parking. Not that it changes a whole lot. But. That's true. And, but I, I think my only caveat to that is we did not include those on-street parking spaces as part of the overall capacity. We didn't increase the 186 to include the on-street parking spaces. That would have been um, a lot more, but we didn't do that. I think it's also important to note that uh, as set forth in his report, the unused parking supply uh, he calculated at 48, that's more than double the 23 that this increase re requires. So it does leave some wiggle room. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Mr. Luke. You have one more? Yes. Thank you. I'd just like to bring Mr. Non back to answer Mr. Cohen's question. His question was, um, do you generally experience uh, much much more business at dinner time than lunch time? Uh, because Mr. Lugio was testifying as to the shared parking, uh, assuming the busiest time is at night when the offices have closed. Yeah, our our experience now since December is that the um, dinner business is many 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 more times the lunch business. Um, so. Our final witness will be our professional planner, Catherine Gregory. Ms. Gregory, would you state your name and spell it for the record? Yes, Catherine Gregory, that's spelled K-A-T-H-R-Y-N, last name Gregory, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y. 
And do you swear or affirm to testify truthfully in this application? Yes, I do. Good, thank you. And will you give the board the benefit of your educational background and qualifications? Yes. Uh, I'm a licensed professional planner in the state of New Jersey and have been so since the year of 2000. I have a Master of Architecture and a Master of Urban Planning from the University of Illinois. Um, I've had my own business now for about 11 years, uh, Gregory Associates, which is located at 96 Linwood Plaza, number 350 in Fort Lee, New Jersey. I've testified around the state as an expert witness for the last 18 years, and I'm also a municipal planner for uh, the communities of Edgewater, Woodland Park, Ridgefield, Little Falls, Clifton, and I know I'm forgetting one. <laughs> I uh, think Western. you're okay. <laughs> is your license current and in good standing? Yes, it is. We accept your credentials. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I won't interrupt you. If you could give the board uh, an overview of what you reviewed, excuse me, in preparation for tonight and your expert opinion as to the variance. Um, certainly. Um, well, obviously, um, I, sub uh, I submitted, I reviewed all the submitted materials that you have before you this evening. I've reviewed your master plan, your master plan reexamination, your zoning ordinance, as well as conducted a site visit. Um, we're here tonight asking for a parking space variance for 23 parking spaces. Um, and so I'm here to testify to that C variance. Um, as you well know, uh, there's two types of C variances. So the C1 in the cases of hardship, um, and that has to do with maybe some topographic features, but it also can do with a structure that exists on a piece of property. And there's also the C2 variance where um, it needs to be rooted in the purposes of zoning and the benefits outweigh the detriments. Um, we also must meet the negative criteria, which is no substantial detriment to the public good and no substantial impairment to the intent and purpose of your zone plan and zoning ordinance. Um, I would advocate our parking variances a little bit of a C1, C2. Um, obviously, we don't have any land really to provide additional 23 parking spaces. Um, so that's where we'd go to somewhat of the hardship. Uh, but it is here for us to convince you that we can justify that parking variance, which we've tried to do this evening. Um, as you well know, uh, our traffic engineer has provided you a an utilization study, a parking utilization study. Um, and he had found that there were 70 spaces that were utilized during the lunch peak hour. And I know that um, your team of experts has agreed that that would be the peak time to study because the offices would actually be utilized at the same time. So that would be basically when most of the parking would be utilized by all of the uses. Um, so that was agreed on. Um, just as well, um, I know that uh, in the IH engineers uh, report, uh, they had conducted a parking observation on Friday, July 6th. Um, and I know, I believe that uh, they mentioned it before, but they found that there were 68 parked vehicles, which really comports with the 70 vehicles. Um, and as a, as a result of our study, we found that there were 48 spaces located in the garage. Um, I do know that there's been a lot of talk about the parking spaces that are on the street. Um, obviously, that's really overflow for the 186, which our engineer had just talked to you about. So we did not consider those in our parking variance. We still have 48 spaces within the garage, which our attorney correctly identified, which is more than double the spaces that we are deficient in. Um, and the uh, prior site plan was actually submitted. Um, and as I understand it, there was no parking variance that was granted at that time. So 186 would meet the criteria for all the uses in this building. But as our, our uh, applicant said, essentially his space um, for the space that he has is actually somewhat underutilized. And obviously he's growing. Um, and so therefore he'd like to you know, accommodate that space and grow it within the building. Um, and we have a limitation in, in the number of parking. Uh, however, uh, what has also been, uh, which I, I was going to note, but actually um, your planning board member Wilson mentioned this, is that uh, based on the fa fact that this is really in a neighborhood, it's a neighborhood destination. So many people are gonna walk. People are choosing to walk now over getting in their cars. I mean, I think that that's probably just a psyche that everyone is very familiar with. Um, and even uh, unless it's like the coldest, coldest of weather, um, people would prefer to walk, and particularly if it's a location where they know that maybe they have to pay to park. So they're gonna walk the you know few blocks from wherever they're coming from instead of actually coming to park in the garage. That's really gonna be for people that are coming from farther distances. So I think that there's gonna be definitely a balance in the number of people that are walking to the restaurant because it is kind of a neighborhood destination. Um, so I think that helps to mitigate the parking variance that we're seeking. Um, 
In terms of the positive criteria, um, I would say that um, I believe that we promote um, purpose E of the municipal land use law. That talks about promotion, uh, excuse me, promoting the establishment of appropriate population densities and concentrations that will contribute to the well-being of persons, neighborhoods, communities, regions, and preservation of the environment. Um, and the reason I say that is that um, the parking variance really won't impact the neighborhood, um, as evidenced by the wealth of testimony this evening, um, because we believe that there is uh, enough parking for any of the, uh, for the overall peak demand. And um, additionally, I would uh, venture to say that in, um, in Mr. West's letter of July 17th, he states, the addition of 89 seats will have a negligible effect on the environment. Um, we do agree that there would probably be a slight increase in traffic, which was also discussed, uh, but not ra raise, or rise excuse me, to the occasion uh, that it would truly impact the neighborhood. In terms of the negative criteria, I don't believe there's any substantial detriment to the public good. Um, and I'm going to go back to one of your experts' letters, which I'm not even going to mention, mention his last name, but in Daniel D. and Associates, July 16th letter, um, he states, a restaurant is a desirable establishment within a mixed-use neighborhood supporting typical needs of residents while encouraging walking and facilitating social interaction, which is, I think, what we were stating before um, in terms of having the, you know, that sort of walkable environment. Uh, in terms of the second prong um, of negative criteria, I don't believe there's any substantial impairment to the intent and purpose of your zone plan and zoning ordinance. Um, I did look at your most recent reexamination from 2017. I didn't address parking particularly. I did address this area and the fact that it was rezoned in mixed use. Um, but I also had the opportunity of looking at your master plan, which was last amended in 2009. Um, and I would say that we do promote uh, one of the land use goals, which would be land use goal seven, use economic and employment growth to preserve the community's quality of life and services. Um, that's basically what we're doing here. We're expanding the restaurant, so we're going to be increasing some employment um, and therefore helping the economic base. So we do promote one of the purposes of your uh, master plan. And I believe that based on the testimony this evening, combined with actually uh, your, engine, uh, excuse me, your experts' reports, we meet both the positive and the negative criteria for granting the, variances, uh, the variance that we've requested this evening. Yeah, um, re relating to the question of hardship, um, has anybody looked into the 500 spaces in the parking garage that are outside of the 186 that are currently dedicated to these buildings? In other words, I think it would help you demonstrate a hardship if you could say those 500 spaces are all required for Avalon Bay, and that, or if they're not all required, that you approached Avalon Bay and tried to get permission to use those spots that were denied. Um, and can you testify to whether anything was looked at in that regard? Uh, to my knowledge, no one has looked into that in connection with this application. Um, and I think really the reason is because the existing 186 spaces can accommodate the proposed increase. So I think you're a C2 variance then, not a C1. Understood. Chairwoman, I first want to thank everyone for their time tonight. Um, I don't think there's any need for me to repeat anything that our witnesses have already said or the board's professionals. Uh, I do believe that we have satisfied the criteria for the variance, and we respectfully request a vote of approval this evening. Thank you. I think before we get into board deliberation about this that we should probably hear from the public and see whether there are any questions or comments that haven't been brought up. If, if I can open the meeting for public comment, if you'd come forward to the, use the microphone here at the podium. Anyone? You mean you're just all sitting there keeping cool for the <laughs> evening? You're part of the next group. All right, if there is no one to speak to this application, then I'll close the public portion of the meeting and board members, is there further discussion, questions that you think haven't been answered? Anyone? 
Just wait a minute, Mr. Porter. I guess in Mr. Stankis's report, he paragraph 22 recommends a condition re, future markings requirement. Is that uh, I, I is, think is that's, that acceptable? Um, let me just take a look. That's if or when. When in the future um, these markings require replacement, he recommends that uh, white star stop mark bar markings legends be used. Yes, I think the only tricky thing is that that would be um, a condition for the owner of the garage to fulfill. Um, we can certainly request that they do it, but we as a tenant of 277 can't represent to the board that we will do it. Does that make sense? Well, you're here representing the, the more than the applicant, right? Because he's correct, but you're the seeking a variance own, on behalf of the owner, right? But the applicant doesn't own the parking right, garage, I understand that. Um, so we can agree to request that that be done by the owner of the garage. Okay. okay. So that that'll be a condition, which will be so sure. stated. Yeah. Yep. Were there any other conditions, staff, that uh, were noted? Nothing anyway. that I have. Anyone? Okay. So the. I mean, I, it's sort of a summary comment. Um, I don't know if we're ready for that yet, but I think generally, uh, I don't have a problem with this application. Uh, you know, especially given the testimony that you don't feel that you need the on-street parking spaces, you know, that you'll be fine without them. Because I do think with the changing um, parking plans in that neighborhood, there's no telling really where things are going to go. The parking spaces on street may go away in terms of the availability to the restaurant employees and patrons. Um, but it's sort of, you know, you're at your own risk uh, in that regard. If you're representing, you're okay with it. Uh, without the on-street spaces, then I don't have a problem with the application. Anyone else? All right. If there's no further comment, I, does anyone feel they would like to make a motion? I'll move approval. Thank you, Louise. Is there a second? For I'll that? second. And is that's it, with the condition that. Well, the approval, the the variance technically is that. Uh, to allow 280, 186 spaces where uh, 209 would be otherwise required. Correct. Uh, and subject to the condition that you'll work and hopefully uh, talk your owner into the condition recommended by the Mr. Stankis's group. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, are there any further comments? Would you like to call the roll, please? Mr. Cohn? Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Mr. Stankowitz. Yes. Mr. Texorni. Yes. Mrs. Ullman. Yes. Mrs. Wilson. Yes. Mrs. Gunning. Yes. Ms. Sachs. Yes. Mr. Oakman. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. She was at Saratoga in, in uh, August. She actually raised this night. You want to stick around to for <laughs> Yeah. Saratoga. Kishinka or something. Uh, Crazy. You okay? From your thing?
All right, the second hearing this evening is 20 Nassau Street Professional Building, and this is Nassau and Chambers Street, Block 19.02, Lot 19. Um, and I guess Chris was the... Yes. Uh, Chris Cazenda, board planner for, for the, this application. If you could tell yeah. us what it's all and about. I think I need to swear. Mr. Cazenda, do you swear or affirm to testify truthfully? Yes, yes I do. Thank you. Okay, so this application is similar to the last application you just heard, except on a much smaller scale. So this is regarding a, a building commonly referred to 20 Nassau Street Professional Building at the corner of Nassau and Chambers Street. Uh, the applica applicant is seeking a minor site plan with parking variance for, for essentially a change of use uh, for two small stores, not one, but two. Uh, the property contains a multi-story mixed-use building consisting of retail and office uses that occupies really the majority of the lot, uh, and there's no on-site parking. The ground floor of the building along uh, Nassau Street has seven small stores. They're about 11, 12 feet wide each and about 80 feet in depth. At the center of this building along Nassau Street is a uh, center entry feature that provides access to the upper floors of the building. Uh, the seven stores in question, I'll refer to them as A through G, as I believe the applicant is referred to in their documents. And this application is specifically for a minor site plan parking variance for stores F and G. On page three, my report dated August 27, 2018, there is a screenshot from Google Maps Street View that highlights specifically where F and G are. It's really at the corner of the building closest to uh, Chambers Street. The F store is a retail store, uh, currently Dynasty Arts, as referred to in the documents, but I believe it's now Merge Gallery. The, uh, that store seeks a change of use to a restaurant, specifically Small Bites with Local Greek. Uh, it's got a mezzanine level in total about a little over 1,000 square feet. Store G has a, is also a retail store, uh, currently Benefit Cosmetics, and that also seeks to be uh, a change of use to a restaurant, specifically Sacred, uh, Sacred Coffee. And uh, this store, without the mezzanine, is a little under 1,000 square feet. So about 1,000 square feet each, so pretty small stores. Um, there's really no major exterior work proposed at this time, uh, and except for uh, typical tenant fit-out work, the really only major change to the interior will be a exhaust makeup air system for store F for their local Greek store, uh, restaurant rather. So in terms of the zoning review, um, I'll just touch up briefly on Jack and Derek's report dated August 16, 2018. I'll start with proposed uses. They are both permitted uses. The restaurant uses are both permitted uses, uh, provided they are no more than 10,000 square feet each. As I mentioned before, they're only 1,000 square feet. Uh, regarding the bulk regulations, specifically to parking, the site is already non-compliant with parking. There's no parking on the site. But the uh, in a downtown setting, like, like the last application, uh, it is surrounded by on-street parking, and there's multiple garage facilities uh, in the neighborhood. Um, let's see, moving on to 3.2 remainder. Uh, as I said, there's really no parking spaces available on the site. The proposed change of use requires uh, an aggregate for the two stores. It's just under one single parking space, but if you look at each store individually, it's less than one half of a single parking space. So that, that shows how um, minor or the, the deviation that is being requested uh, I should note that there actually is a provision in the ordinance that allows for when there is a request for one additional parking space, it is exempt from having to receive, basically go through this process to get minor site plan approval. However, that could only be done uh, once in a lifetime of a building. And after speaking with the zoning officer, Derek, explained to me that that ha has already been granted to another use, therefore the applicant has to apply for the variance. Uh, for that one parking space. And actually, it's less than one parking space. We rounded up to one. Uh, regarding the planning review, it, since it is a parking variance, the applicant should be prepared to provide testimony regarding either the C1 hardship or C2 flexible variance. Uh, and the applicant should also be prepared to address both the positive and the negative criteria. And I'll defer to the applicant to provide that. I just want to note again, um, 
we already established that the ordinance specifically provides an opportunity for uh, really a certain administrative exemptions for minor deviations to the parking requirements. Again, it's only permitted once in the lifetime of a building, and had that not occurred, probably would not be here. And uh, if the ordinance had two spaces permitted, probably would not be here either. Therefore, the variance for the, the parking variance is really effectively limited to a matter of procedure. And I, I say this, and I'll go on a quick tangent, is that hypothetically, the previous use that triggered this exception, they may have already reverted back to a less intense use. So perhaps, in theory, they could benefit from an exception, but that's not how the ordinance works. So it certainly has limits, but I understand that it was intended to benefit these minor deviations. So I applaud the uh, municipality for considering that, putting that in place, uh, but something you might want to consider expanding. Uh, so that's it for the zoning and the planning review. I'm just going to touch up on some minor comments uh, that really isn't really related to the use. It's really related to the property. Um, it's not really the responsibility of the applicant to address, but I like something I want to raise during when I made my inspection. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so regarding the plans that were submitted, there was a really minor discrepancy regarding the square footage, and that, that should be clarified. 5.2, traffic generation is really extremely small increase in generation of traffic. Uh, however, the applicant should be, be able to provide some testimony regarding the number of employees with relative to existing retail uses and compare that to the proposed restaurant use. I anticipate there will need to be more employees for the restaurant use than the retail use, even though the square footage is staying the same, there's no addition being added. On to the uh, sixth page, I'll touch up on loading area uh, that's accessible from Chambers Street. The question is whether or not it's sufficient for deliveries, and uh, I should note that there actually is a on-street loading space across the street on Chambers Street, down a, a few feet. So even if the mm. loading facility on-site was not adequate, there is off-site loading that's probably shared with a, a number of businesses and it has existed for quite some time. Uh, 5.4, solid waste and disposal behind a loading area that's accessible from Chamber Street at the back of the building. There is a fenced in solid waste and disposal recycling area. This, we need some testimony regarding whether or not that is ad adequate to handle the additional food waste as well as whether or not it will require additional grease collection. And one of the recommend recommendations I would uh, add as a condition of approval that there should be a written trash recycling delivery plan subject to the review and approval of the land use engineer. And um, in that written, written report, there should also be some sort of statement or agreement that materials should not be left overnight on the street. Regarding the Chamber Street driveway, there is some conflicting signage indicating employee parking or no parking. Uh, and then there's a maintenance vehicle parked in the loading area. It's not clear that always parks there if or if it impedes on collection of uh, trash and recycling or for deliveries. The, um, <clears throat> also, the concrete driveway is not in, a, not in great conditions and fair conditions, so may need some patching. Uh, regarding the Bank Street driveway on the opposite side, uh, there is a piece of property that's only about 12 feet wide and it kind of is a stub from the main part of the property that, that connects to Bank Street opposite of Chamber Street. So the question is whether, what's the purpose of the this stub lane, I assume it's a driveway. And when I did my inspection, I saw two cars parked there. Uh, I'm not sure that impedes on emergency access or whatnot. Uh, and I noted that the driveway apron is consisting of asphalt. Eventually, it should be replaced to concrete with a depressed curb. Uh, not now, but something that should be coordinated with the municipality uh, as a maintenance issue. Regarding bicycle parking, as we know, we pretty passionate about providing bicycle parking. There's really no room on, on the site. There actually is already two bicycle racks within the Nassau Street public right-of-way, which is great. Uh, one of the things that, again, not something that the applicant really is aware of, but I think something that this body, with a, along with the mayor and council, uh, consider taking one of the parking spaces along Nassau Street and do a bike corral that's similar to the one that's on that Witherspoon Street across from Heinz Plaza. And uh, moving on to stormwater and landscaping, really no substantive comments there other than perhaps consider additional potted plants along Nassau Street and refinish or replace decorative accent lighting and paint, if not, if possible, remove some of the conduit along the Chambers Street facade. Uh, otherwise, I'll defer to the board as well as the Historic Preservation Committee. And finally, last two comments, uh, Section 8.1. Final design and rooftop units to be subject to review and approval of the land use engineer. We just want to make sure that 
uh, it is adequate, doesn't create vibration and impact any adjacent uses or uses it above, and is otherwise screened or situated in a way that's not visible from the street. And mm. finally, sustainable practices. I would suggest that applicant encourage the uh, tenants to consider organic waste disposal, uh, utilizing recyclable compost takeout containers, which I believe a number of businesses on Nassau Street have done. They even have signage in the windows saying that that's what they do. It's great. And, and during the tenant fit up work, the uh, applicant should encourage the tenant to use water sense rated fixtures, LED, uh, warm light, warm color LED light fixtures, and then utilize green building materials. That's all I have. Any questions for Chris? Anyone? Um, let's see. Jack, did you have something? Um, nothing else to add. Derek? I would uh, just uh, piggyback on his comments, Chris's comments about the trash and the recycling and the, the loading. Um, we actually pushed this application to get here for the parking variance and uh, it's our understanding that, that they will come back for the administrative waiver or site plan for any roof penetrations and to just detail how their trash will be collected. And they need to go through a historic preservation process for any new signage uh, that will be there. But uh, we just wanted to get the parking variance um, moving along so they could get along with their business. Um, in terms of the ordinance, uh, Chris mentioned that the town should look at changing this ordinance or revisiting it. Um, there is discussion to do that. Uh, Parking's always been a, a, a touchy subject in town. Um, I think in discussions with the mayor and the Economic Development Committee that looks at parking, um, there will be some revision to this ordinance. I think it will be done when there's more of a macro parking ordinance through the whole town pass so that we can adjust some of the things David spoke about at the other site on street parking. So that is on the minds of uh, the mayor and council. Um, okay. So thanks. Anyone? <clears throat> Quick question about this area that you referred to as the stub that's next to the access driveway. Is this parking for the dwelling that's next door or is it parking for, I'm assuming that right here, the access off of Bank Street, there's a shaded area there that you yeah, said. That, that's lot 18, I believe. It's a 12, 11.73 foot really alley that gets to the back of the building. What's adjacent to, on the right side is uh, relative to looking from Bank Street. On the right side is a parking area, which I believe is for another use, not associated with 20 Nassau Street. And on the left side is a structure that looks like a single family dwelling, but may have been converted to some sort of office use or may still be residential. It's okay, so office. we have no idea who's parking there and what their, which site they're attached to, correct? Well, the applicant should be able to address it, but I used to work in that building many years ago, and those were paid parking spaces that were given to tenants in the building if they were willing to pay the extra parking fee. Oh, thank you, David. That's helpful. Okay. Um, all right. I think it's time to hear from the applicant on this one. Did I say something historical about this, Chris? You know, Princeton Future is not the first organization of the sort that did this, sort of tried to redo the town. There was something called the Ar Architectural Improvement Society, and they worked with tw 20 Nassau to put this building up. The back part of it was a parking garage that was attached to it. Only the row of stores in front were there originally. In fact, they, it was like that until after World War II. And parking garages have a finite life because of the wear and tear of vehicles. So the parking garage thing first became a bicycle repair shop. And then in the days when there were a lot more bicycles, and then it was converted in, into stores. But when we talk about the absence of parking, this was a structure that in fact brought its parking with it and then at some point it lost it. So these things go through the zoning process and then disappear. Someone had a great idea for parking downtown and it didn't work out. The other thing I should say is that this was regarded as the biggest eyesore that had been built in Princeton in the, in the 1920s because it was not collegiate Gothic and that was 
the, the mode of the day and having delayed things, let's hear now from the applicant about today's building. <clears throat> Great, Go ahead. thank you. Um, for the record, my name is Christopher de Grezia from the law firm of Drinker, Biddle, and Wreath. And to the extent I provide any testimony, I swear or affirm to tell the truth. Thank you. Um, I think your planner consultant kind of covered all of the details, but uh, this is a really simple application and it's about a change of tenancy. So the applicant here has this building that pretty much covers the entire block and two tenants are moving out and they are looking for two new tenants to move in. In the normal course, this would be a really simple application. Um, however, because we are moving from a retail use in both locations to a food and service reuse, when you do the evaluation of parking, we're triggering a parking variance. And it's a really, really small <laughs> parking variance, but it's still a parking variance. Um, even in terms of retail and um, food service use, if you look at your standard, it's very similar. So when you have a retail use, you're required to have one parking space per every 475 square feet. And when you have a restaurant use, it's one space per 400 square feet. So that 475 to 400 triggers this decimal point. So for each, each of these stores, we're required to get less than a half space. And when you add them together, we are deficient by 0.81 or 0.82 parking, 0 0.81 or 0 0.82 parking spaces. And essentially that's why we're here. So we're here today to request a parking space for that 0 0.81, 0 0.82, or one parking space, um, assuming you round up. Um, the exception is a great idea, and um, it was used on this property, which isn't unusual, because you have a, a block, you know, so it treats a property that's a block long as if it was a property that was a quarter square, you know, you know, sm very small property. Um, Interestingly, it based is on structure, and if you look at this building, it actually is made up of small buildings and like four or five of them, and you could probably say, hey, there's an exemption four or five times for this, but Derek didn't go along with me on that. But it, it, it could, it's a reasonable argument because it, you are looking at the size of the structure and it breaks down and should be appropriately scaled so that this type of de minimis trigger um, helps out in situations where it um, really doesn't have a negative impact. Um, so a couple points, I think he covered them, but I just want to make it very clear. We're not expanding the areas. We're not adding any f uh, floor area. We're not expanding the building. We're not changing anything other than interior changes to put the new tenants in. And I guess we'll come back for a sign, which essentially be on the awning. So. Over the last four to five years, this building has really made great efforts to improve aesthetically. So um, from the 1920 eyesore, it really has made a lot of progress. So if you look at pictures just, I'm, I'm telling you, just like five, six years ago, especially on the Chamber Street side, it was a hodgepodge of different things, awnings, no awnings. Um, and uh, the applicant came in, put together a package of an awning design, carried it through, different light fixtures, improved the doors. So overall, it really looks nice. It's, an, it's a vibrant, active area now. Um, and I think that they want to continue that. So part of the problem is when you have a small, rest, a small store of 1,000 square feet, um, finding a tenant is pretty difficult. Retail just doesn't survive at 1,000 square feet. Shopping has changed. You got the internet, you have the big box, and that's really, most of the time, that's what's gonna work. So um, rather than having an empty building, we wanna fill it with something that'll keep the, cor the corner lively, keep the building lively. It fits into the streetscape, 
And again, it's a permitted use. Um, but for that decimal point of half parking spaces for each, less than half for each, each, uh, each store, we wouldn't be here um, because it's a permitted use. Um, so I don't go on too long. I'd like to introduce um, my first witness, Rich Gittleman, who is the leasing manager. He can tell you a little bit more about his process and um, how he's tried to find tenants for these two spaces where the tenants have left. Um, and just to, to comment on the point you made, so both of the spaces are vacant now. However, in um, the Dynasty Arts, there's a pop-up pop up temporary um, called Merge Gallery. That's just a temporary thing that they put in there to try to make it look like it's not, you know, going to be a dark space. So it's there temporarily, and we're looking for not a Band-Aid, but a long-term <clears throat> solution here. Oh, so... If we could have Richard this morning. Yes, sir. Mr. Gilliman, do you swear or affirm to testify truthfully in this application? I do. Thank you. State your name and spell it for the record. Richard Gittleman, R-I-C-H-A-R-D-G-I-T-T-L-E-M-A-N. Richard, can you just give us a, a, just a brief outline of the steps you've taken to try to secure new tenants and if any, if you had any difficulties? <clears throat> Um, it's practically impossible to get new retail tenants today. We've lost, um, uh, let's see, we have lost, the flower shop came and went in one year. We lost Puebla, which was a, a photography place in one year. Benefit has closed after five years, and uh, Dynasty Arts closed after many years. Um, we're fortunate in that um, we got one clothing store opening um, that came over from was doing a pop up in Palmer Square, and we got a call. We got another gentleman who um, has opened a place called um, what's it called? <laughs> oh no, the <laughs> anyway, he sells. Um, used luxury clothing items. Um, Midtown Authentic, thank you. It's getting close to my bedtime, so my memory's not there. Um, it's very hard to find retail tenants today. Uh, we're blessed to have um, several that have been there a long time and, and look like they're gonna continue. Um, but really, the only people that have approached us uh, other than restaurants have been uses that we would not consider, such as a vape shop and things like that. And I'm sure the town would also not want to consider them. So, um, you know, and I, I walk around town and talk to retailers, see if anybody wants to move, and, you know, it's nobody wants to move. You know, it's hard enough to do business today. So, it's very hard. Any questions for her? Yes. Anyone? Okay, since we are talking about the uh, parking variance and the impact of the point eight two, um, I'd like to call up our parking consultant to just address that. Oh, you have something else to say? Well, can we talk about, answer the questions? Do you want to go through the, the reports right now? Yeah. Okay, all right, we can we can touch upon that and then we'll go to our consultant. Several things report. were raised in the, in the um, in this gentleman's report that I'd like to address, the um, he raised the issue of outside lighting. That has already been approved and it's in the works. The um, the awnings have all been size, the size and uh, placement of the awnings has all been approved by Historic. That was all done before, and and basically it's a formality. They'll have to get the color approved for the new awnings. Um, and the signage on the awning approved, mm -hmm. but the, the structure, the frame of the awning stays as is. So that's all done. Uh, you raise the issue of trash. Um, we already have one restaurant in the building, Jam and Crepes, which um, uh, participates in, in um, the uh, compost program in town, and also we have extensive recycling in the building. Uh, we've been meeting with the health department uh, to come up with a plan to have a, a trash can washout station. Um, 
I've informed the other two gentlemen with the other two restaurants that they will participate in the composting as well. And uh, from what I understand, the composting outfit is going to change um, from those small cans that they use, uh, they're changing to allow for small dumpsters, which will save us footprint um, and, and uh, be much more convenient. Um, each store is responsible for their own uh, collection of grease, and those are removed by, offs by uh, vendors that come to the building. Um, so the, I think we're, we've addressed the trash. We're, it, you know, it's something we have to keep up with, and um, you know, but nobody leaves trash out overnight. And, and just to clarify, our position is there's adequate space back there, and we would agree to your recommendation in the report that we provide a written trash uh, recycling plan once it's fully developed. Um, I'd, I'd love to say that the loading dock is used for all the deliveries for the building, but I would be lying. Um, most of the deliveries uh, pull up to the curb and as close to the store as possible early in the morning. Uh, the loading dock is used primarily by vendors doing construction work in the building. The three spaces on, on uh, Bank Street are used by the management staff of the building. And um, you'll see us out there sometimes when the person that has been there the earliest has to leave first and we have to jockey all the cars on a one-way street. It's a lot of fun, actually. We should probably sell tickets. We'd make some money. Um, I'm trying to think what else you raised. Uh, we do recommend uh, all the new light bulbs for tenants. In fact, we use them in all the office space. Uh, we will be removing the um, employee parking sign because that's just yes. confusing. Um, oh, the apron in, in, on the Bank Street lot was actually approved by the engineer. I don't know if it was Jack or his predecessor, but the, the thought was it needed to be redone. We didn't want to spend a lot of money because Bank Street's going to be redone at some point, and uh, so we asked if it was okay just to cover it with macadam. Um, I think that was it, right? I'm sorry, I'm not clear what was just said. I mean, there was a recommendation I, I, and I a don't statement. know if there was a recommendation to do anything at this time. I read it that it was something that should be, you know, first of all, the that side of the building is not really part of this application. It's on a separate lot. <laughs> um, and the macadam is actually, uh, uh, the asphalt is, um, the macadam is in good condition. Let me make a suggestion, okay. uh, just so we have an orderly record on, uh, I guess, on page six of Chris's, uh, Chris Consensus report. Um, there are a set of conditions that probably start under 5.4. So 5.4 requires a, tra a written trash and recycling plan. you said that's okay. Plan. We agree to that. Okay. Uh, 5.5 discusses the loading areas. We, we do, we, it is available for loading. We've told them in practice it's ma mostly used by maintenance, um, but we are going to remove the employee parking sign, so it'll just say no parking there now. Uh, 5.6, uh, that talks about um, the other side of the property. It's, you know, basically it's, it's, we feel it's in good condition the apron. I don't know if he's actually requesting it done now or not, but. Just to clarify on the apron, I would recommend that it wouldn't be done at this time. I know the engineering department has been working on the plans for, for Bank Street for some time. They're going to uh, the State Historic Preservation Office. So there's a lot of detail as far as even what the materials are ultimately going to be. So I would just defer that until when the road is redone, hopefully so it, next year. Not part of, not a condition of this application. That's correct. Okay. We agree with Jack on that one. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. <laughs> um, with regard to the bike parking, there's really no availability here, and that's sort of a municipal issue to evaluate. And We um, actually have quite a few tenants that ride their bikes and take them into their office suites. In fact, um, I can show you marks that have been left on the wall by the tires, which is a... So I'm sorry, just and so then, uh, I guess 
But you're asking, you're suggesting the board that no additional bike parking be required. Right. At this time, yes. I, I don't know if you actually had it as a condition that we provide bike parking. I, I didn't read it that way. Uh, no, you're correct. Uh, but I think we need to address to the, the recommendation, no, which recommendation is. to the board. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I think we jump down to. Um, 70. 70. Um, yeah, we had a lighting plan approved as part of the um, um, the upkeep of the building, part of the renovations, and I think it's partly implemented and not fully at this point. Yes. So is it part of is, is Not it, part of this at all. There's no lighting changes proposed, right. no landscape. So no condition as to that. Yeah. And, um, and with eight... Um, the rooftop units should be situated in screen. Yeah, we agree with that. Um, Historic Preservation Committee will, whenever we come in with the, basically we're not changing any structure, so the awning's gonna be the same. It's just an issue of color and replacing the name, maybe the shape of the letters, what font we use, and Historic's gonna review that. I don't know if they process it administratively or however they do, but it'll just be in the normal course, as if it's a regular change of tenancy. And we uh, already checked with them. This it didn't have to be done for this. Yeah, we, this we didn't point. propose anything at this right. time, so we don't have anything on the table in terms of signage proposed. So when you do, that'll be submitted to HPC. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then uh, we'll, we encourage tenants, I think, across the board, um, and we do have LED fixtures installed in the offices. Um, and we always encourage that type with the tenants who are responsible for their own fit out. And I think that's it. Um, so I'd like to have our traffic engineer, George Jackamar. I know George has been here many, many times, um, but I think if we go quickly through your qualifications. Um, yes, good evening. Uh, my uh, name is you okay? You in, Mr. Okay. Giacomo? Welcome back. I do. Uh, thank you. swear firm to testify truthfully in this application. I do. Thank you. Um, I am a professional engineer licensed in New Jersey. I also have become a PP lately. I passed that exam. Oh, nice. <laughs> Not easy. Yeah. I, I think, um, anyway, I've testified Giacomo, many times. You've been here enough times. Thank you. The board yeah. is familiar. Thank, we accept your qualifications. So I'm not going to go through the calculations again of the parking variance. It is about 0.8 of a space, uh, the variance. Uh, I think obviously the hardship is uh, it's practically impossible to provide a parking space or the number of parking spaces on this lot. The only thing I want to add to the conversation is that I, I think there are two qualitative factors that mitigate that 0.8 parking spaces. And the first one is that you know, that we moved from an, uh, two retail businesses that to some degree, and I, I couldn't tell you how much, what percentage, to some degree, the trips that were made to those retail businesses were what we call destination trips, meaning those were people that went specifically to downtown to go to that particular business, especially, I think, the Asian uh, art business that had antiques and so on. That tends to attract some people that go specifically to that use. Cosmetics, I don't know, maybe some. I don't buy cosmetics, so I don't know much <laughs> about that. But, and then, whereas the new uses, those fast, the food and espresso place, I would say they're practically 100%. Only, they attract only people that are, are already in the downtown area or on the Princeton University campus. So that in terms of actual parking demand, the people that are going to go to the espresso place or the Greek food place, are people that are already parked or people that walk from their job, walk from their, their home. So it's difficult to translate that into you know, another fraction of a parking space, but it is a, quantitative, a qualitative factor that I think uh, you should take into consideration. The other one is also the type of employees. I think uh, your consultant asked a number of employees. There may be you know, two or three more employees in the new uses, especially the Greek food place may have a few more. But these employees, you know, they're at the lower scale of the, the salaries. They tend to walk or bicycle or use public transportation much more than the previous employees that were there that were more the owners of the business or the owners of the concession uh, for that particular store. So I do think that the bottom line, the reality is that it's 
no impact, you know, nothing that we could measure, we could go out and measure it. In addition, I just want to remind everyone, we're very close to the Chamber Street garage. There is a garage as, as generally has parking capacity, available parking capacity, so I, I don't see any problem with this uh, variance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Jacquemar? Anyone? No? Okay. Uh, from a legal perspective, and it, we wrote about it in uh, the, the, the materials we submitted, uh, we believe that the variance is justified under both the C2 criteria and the C1 criteria, the hardship and the flexible. Hardship being that um, we have a situation where we have existing space, we want to occupy that space with a viable use, and we have a building that covers the entire block and nowhere to put the parking. So um, that we think that believe, we believe that meets the C1 criteria. And then with C2, um, the converse is if we don't have the space occupied, a black, you know, windows, dark store, really has an impact, not just to the building, but to the streetscape and to the community. And we believe that this small de minimis, less than a parking requirement, a space par requirement, when you balance it out, um, is justified based on the benefits of having something lively and vibrant and part of the streetscape. Um, and we think that the aesthetics of the building and keeping it active and keeping it part of um, you know, the, the vibrant street is, is important. Um, again, when you look at both of those standards, you're looking at negative criteria as, as well. And I think our parking consultant has gone through that and has talked about how a point A2 requirement or any other negative impacts are not going to be material. When you look at the negative standard, the negative criteria, the key word is substantially. Any change of use always has impacts, but it needs to be substantial. It needs to be material. And when you take a look at does it impact the neighborhood, the questions you typically get is, is it lowering property values? Is it changing or damaging the character of the neighborhood? And, and when you take a look at the criteria, it's really enhancing it and keeping it active and a part of the streetscape. So um, I think that's really all we have in terms of our presentation. We have a whole slew of other people to answer questions that you may have, but um, that's really all we have at this point. All right, maybe I'll open the the meeting to the public. I don't know whether all of these people just came to, to listen to it or whether they'd like to speak, but anyway, let me open it. If you'd like to speak, would you come up to the podium and be recognized? Anyone? It's your chance. Hmm? Oh, you certainly are very attentive for people who have nothing to say about the application, but. Let me close the public portion and ask the board members if any further discussion, any further questions? I, I have a, a question or two that are purely questions out of curiosity <laughs> for, the, for the local Greek proprietors are here. Um, and one is, um, will this be your second store? I mean, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm asking if you intend to move your restaurant or whether you're opening a second site and will keep the original uh, restaurant location open on Lee Street, corner of Lee yeah. and John. Yeah. I guess they will have to I come up to, to, to the microphone in. and be yeah. sworn in. I think the intent is to keep two open, but we'll have him. <clears throat> come up to, oh, is that microphone working? or? If we could just get your name and you could get sworn in. Yeah, would you state your name for the record and spell it? Uh, Anthony Kantarakis, K-A-N-T-E-R-A-K-I-S. Yeah. And to the extent that you're going to answer a question, I assume you're going to respond truthfully? Yes. Thank you. You heard the question. Uh, yeah, this is a bit, this will be a second second location. We're not, the one on the okay. avenue is, is the main mm -hmm. location. Will there be indoor seating and outdoor seating? I know that I don't know how it compares size-wise with jam and crepes. I'm just curious. 
Well, currently they would need a variance for parking to seat outside, but we're looking to change the outdoor dining uh, sidewalk cafe ordinance that treats both private land and public land the same. So hopefully that'll be accomplished in the next few months and it might even work for your other uh, site on the avenue. Good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, anyone? Um, well, go ahead. Actually, I just had a comment. I wanted to thank um, Mr. Jackamard for his brief and cogent observations. I found, I found your observations helpful and um, convincing. Yeah, this is just a general comment in terms of, uh, you know, the ordinances overall. I mean, I, I really feel like we shouldn't be getting variances related to parking with these properties. I feel like, you know, parking should should not be an issue. I mean, people, people, people. There's no way that these businesses can provide parking in the the context. And so I don't know why we're talking about this. And so, I mean, if there's something else, yeah, so be it. But you know, I feel like we shouldn't be talking par about parking in these types of businesses. So. I think that we need to change the ordinance. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Elvin? Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of resenting on that, although I, I think the zoning is useful when you don't want something to happen that might. Um, in this case, I think we all have jam and grapes to thank for enlivening that end of town. It, I mean, I would love to go there, but from my end of town, <laughs> You can't get there. By the time you've parked a car, everything's filled up. So I, I think it's great. And I think nothing could be a more compatible use, actually, than local Greeks, which has just been a, a raging success, as far as I can see. So both of them seem to me just great um, assets to our walkable, vibrant town. and. Um, Let's squeeze them in however we do it, and um, I, I, am, I am for it. I agree. I agree. Okay, and now that you've all agreed, would someone like to make a motion to that? <laughs> I'll move approval. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Are there any further comments? Alan, would you like to go over the conditions? Yeah, I think the conditions that were boiled down uh, had to do with a a written trash recycling plan uh, as stated uh, in 5.4 of the report. Um, uh, item 5.5, a no parking sign will be uh, established. The rooftop uh, units will be subject to the approval as set forth in 8.1 and 8.2, the signage will be subject to the approval of uh, HPC. Uh, gentlemen, with any other conditions that survived? No, I think that covers everything. Thanks. So it's minor site plan with the parking variance for the point, whatever, eight <laughs> spaces subject to those conditions. Okay, and the people who made and seconded the motion, those were the conditions you had in mind, right? Correct. All right. Yeah. Could you call the roll, please? Mr. Cohn? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Mr. Stankowitz? Yes. Mr. Texarney? Yes. Mrs. Ullman? Yes. Ms. Wilson? Yes. Mrs. Gunning? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Mr. Oakman? Yes. Motion carried. Thank All you right. very much. Make a motion. You know, this building before they moved to adjourn. Second. Had all the original signs on the top for airplanes. I did. I'll second that. Did we entertain a motion to adjourn? I moved it. Got second. And did everyone agree? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. There was a big arrow that indicated exactly which way we 